on Wednesday, we started the discussion of the resurrection. There were some that thought the resurrection didn't happen, but we know that it did and continues to do so for the sake of people. That's kind of where we left it off uh, last week. Today we're picking it up at the end of that section in verse 23 of chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. And we're going to move forward. And then we're, what we're going to do today is we're going to go over what is going to happen at the end. Um, dominion, power, authority, who has it, who had it, who's going to have it for now into eternity. And what that actually means for us. So we're going to get into that in today's episode of The Word. Stick with us. With us, with us, right there. There you are. And uh, we'll get right to it. Hang on. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So we know that the resurrection happened. Paul uses a brilliant argument just to show that fact that the resurrection happened based upon scripture and everything else. So now he's going to move on from there post-resurrection, in a sense. So what's going to happen after resurrection? What's going to happen after we end up in heaven? And that's where Paul's going to get to this morning as we kind of continue our thoughts. So grab your Bibles, please, and I'll pause for this for a little bit and let you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to start at verse 23 where we left off uh, on Wednesday and we're going to go through verse 28, 23 through 28. So grab your Bibles. We'll be right back. All right, Bibles at the ready. Excellent. So verse 23, chapter 15, 1 Corinthians but each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who puts all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. So, now we're getting to the end, the ushering in of eternity. Because resurrection is one thing. Resurrection to come back to life. That's kind of, although loose in its interpretation, what resurrection fundamentally means. It's a lot tighter and a lot stronger and a lot deeper than what I just said. But the resurrection is not more than just uh, coming back to life. It's resurrection to what? To where? To when? To how? Resurrection is to eternity. Now, the resurrections that occurred within the framework of Scripture, all those people died. I'm, I'm looking at Lazarus, Martha and Mary's brother. God, Jesus raised him from, from death. Uh, he'd been in the tomb for four days. We all know this, right? Did Lazarus live forever? No. Well, he does because of his faith in God, but not on earth. He died again. And so whoever was raised, the widow's son from Nain, or Nain, if you want to pronounce it correctly, um, <clears throat> they all died a second time. But the resurrections in those examples, in those situations, were just that. An example of the foretaste of what was going to come next. You see, those of us who will be raised, those of us who believe, will be raised to eternal life. And that is where our text is going. It's going to look at what is ending and what is beginning 
And the other side of that same coin is who's in charge of everything. Now, as we look at our text, before we dive into it, we start to see, because of this particular text, how Satan could have thought, although misguided and a flat-out lie, that this creation belonged to him. All that Jesus had to do was bow down and worship Satan because he thought he was in charge. Paul is very clear as to who is in charge, both of the here and now and the here and hereafter. It's God the Father. And it has been given to God the Son in this time period before resurrection eternity begins. Let's kind of go into this again. So we're all raised, as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, Jesus needs to be raised first, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. So <clears throat> resurrection, those who have fallen asleep in the faith, will come back to life. Paul also describes this phenomenon and this event <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians, where he says the trumpet blast will occur, Jesus Christ will descend, those who have uh, gone before, who've been buried in the ground, those who have died will rise up out of the graves, those who are still left will rise up to meet Jesus in the air. Now we'll meet Jesus, we won't stay there, obviously we won't stay in the air, we'll kind of or this will be the beginning of the ushering in of eternity. It's a constant with Paul's writings that he says the exact same thing here, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom of, to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. We have an arrogance about the human race. Everything that we put is good. <clears throat> that everything that we've done is wonderful. And every principality, every power, every authority has been good and righteous. And there's nothing wrong with good. But it's the arrogance that it's the end all and the be all. It isn't the end all and the be all. What it is, is just a temporary situation might last for a couple of hundred years, 500 years, a thousand years, whatever the length of time it lasts, but it is going to come to an end at some point in time. Whether it's going to end before Jesus comes back or whether it's going to end when Jesus comes back. But everything here on this earth is going to end. It will not continue. It will not go on forward because sinful and broken things cannot live in a perfect environment. Just can't live there. That's why believing in Jesus' resurrection is so wonderful. He takes us from the imperfect, the sinful, and makes us righteous so that we can live with God, not just for today, but forever. And that's what this is kind of pointing us toward that we will live with God forever. But everything else, what we're living in right now, is going to come to an end. It's going to quit. Because this cannot exist with that. Cannot exist with eternity. Cannot exist. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Jesus has a lot of enemies. <clears throat> Jesus has a lot of problems. It's called sin. In the world. It's called human arrogance. It's called human pompousness. It's called humans thinking that I'm the best all and be all and everything else that goes along with the all. No, 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 no. We are confused when we think that we reign this world. No, 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 and no. Okay, I'm getting no crazy. Jesus is in charge. Flat out, Jesus is in charge. He has sent the Holy Spirit to guide the church, to direct the church, to cause the church to realize that he is in charge of this world. Not Satan, not human flesh, Jesus. 
is in charge. The sooner we begin to realize that more fully, the sooner we're going to be happy as Christian people and as people in general. Because even though we have some good authorities and we have some bad authorities, even though we have some good uh, powers, we have some bad powers. And that's what happens when you're dealing with the human race. But when you're dealing with Jesus and Jesus being in control of everything, that's all good. That's all wonderful. That's all blessed. That's all fantastic, to use that figure of speech. So, we have this wonderful life that God has given to us, both right now, living in his resurrection, and living, we will be living in his resurrection after he returns, forever. We'll be living in his resurrection. So, Jesus is in charge until the, all of his enemies are under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And the only time that's going to happen is at his resurrection. When Jesus comes back, death is over. Death no longer has anything. That doesn't mean death has a hold on us. Death does not have a hold on Christians. Death does not have a hold on us because we believe in the life that is in Jesus Christ. That's something we continually need to wrap our head around. Death does not have a hold on us. That doesn't mean we act willy-nilly and crazy and, and do all kinds of silly things. No, not at all. But what that does mean is it tailors the way we do live. We live with the assurance that we're going to live forever. Death has no hold on us. Jesus said to Nicodemus, even though he dies, yet will he live those who believe in me. So the beautiful thing about all of this is we will live forever. That's what we hold on to now. That's what we will have later. So the last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. Uh, that's Jesus. The Father has put the Son in charge. Everything subjection to him. Which means he's the ultimate authority. For God has put all things under its subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted. He, meaning the Jesus and also the Father, is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. So when all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him so that God may be all in all. Okay, there's a lot of word there for subjection. He uses it a multiple amount of times. But the point is, it points to us like who is in charge. Right now, it's Jesus, the Son of God. He is in charge. The Father has given that to him, has delegated that authority, that power, that, that grace to subject everything to him. So we think, let's say, we use this as an example, People think, I'm the, ma the master of my own destiny. I am the one in charge of my own life. That's a falsehood. <clears throat> no, you're not. There is always, always someone who is over you. And that person is Jesus. And when you believe in Jesus, you realize that, and you put your life into his hands. And then you ask God, the Holy Spirit, to continue to guide you and strengthen you through the grace and mercy that God has given you in Jesus. And when everything is all said and done, this creation is all finished, all kaput, no more, no more of this creation. Jesus is about ready to usher in eternity. Then Jesus hands over the authority and the power to the, back to the Father. And Jesus becomes subject to the Father. And Jesus becomes our great and wonderful ally. And then we live in eternity like that. Then we live eternally with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and everything's going to be fantastic. Wonderful. So it's about who's in charge, this passage for us today. It is about who is guiding and directing our lives. And the sooner we realize that God is guiding and directing our lives through the work of Jesus Christ, he is, he is our king, he is our prince, and the Holy Spirit is our guide. The sooner we realize all this, the better off we're going to be 
both now as well as forever. If you have any questions, please make a question on a comment. If you have any comments, please comment. Also, it's going to be great to hear from you. And uh, I thank you for your attention today. We will be back again tomorrow morning for the next episode of The Word. We'll see you later. Have a good day.